Hi, everyone. I think every table has their dessert already. Just, and there's about 50 or people waiting at home to begin the lecture. That, that will happen soon. If you want coffee, there is coffee over there. May I recommend decaf for all of us of a certain age? <laughs> we drink real coffee now. The benchers are on the table. Please join me in Birkat Hamazan, and then we will be privileged to hear from Professor Burke. Page 42. Shir Hamalot Beshuv Adonai Eshivat Sionai Nukecholim Azimale Sechot Pinu Ulshone Nurina Az Yomru Vagoim Higdil Adonai La Sotimele Higdil Adonai La Sotimanu Hainu Semechim Shuv Adonai Eshevitenu Ka Afikim Banegev Hazorim Bedima Berina Yixoru Haloch Yelechu Vacho No Semeshech Hazara Bo Yavo Yavo Verina No Se Alumotav Tehilat Adonai Etaber Pi Bivarech Kol Basar Shem Kodsho Leolam Bo Ed Banach Ne Nevarech Ya Me Atavi Adolam Hallelujah Hodu la donai ki tov, ki le olam chaz do mi amalel gvu rota donai, yash mi akol tehilato. Page 44. Yehi Shem Adonai Mivarach me atavi adolam, beer shu chavirai, nevarach elohinu shechalu mi shalom. Baruch Eloheinu Shachanu Mishalov Tuvo Chayinu Baruch Hu Baruch Shemo Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Azan Et HaOlam Kulo Betuvo Bechen Bechesed Uvrachamim Hu Noten Lechem Lechol Basar Ki Leolam Chazdo Uvtuvo Hagadol Tami lochasar lanu ve ayachsar lanu ma azon leolam vo et bavur shemo hagadol ki huzanu farnes lakol umetiv lakol umechin ma azon lechol briotav asher bara baruch ata adonai hazan et hakol no delecha nei shadav kini as kadav deracha for tanu mi mercy tanu mi zivina mi repatim val briach shadav tanu zivina mi tarach shadav tanu mi chal kach shadav tanu achim mechaz shadav tanu mi kumas shadav tanu mi lechol etu vechol shav yalakol when I have to do that, I keep on trying to rush it. When I do that, I'm in all of it. Kakatu v'achalta v'savata uveirachta et Adonai Elohecha al ha'aretz atova asher natan lach baruchata Adonai al ha'aretz v'al hamazon. Red Seva Halite, new under nine Hemis for Taha, meets by Mashish, but a cold of a dosh has a key. I'm like a dog, a carashi, lip and a halish, but fell in your 
What did I learn the four years that I was in USY? I learned how to bench. Baruch Hashem. All right, my friends, welcome. Welcome. Um, I've had the honor, the pleasure with my family. We've been sitting with uh, Diane and Clarice and, and Phyllis and, of course, the Burks as well. Professor Stephen Burke is a professor of history at Union College in Schenectady, New York, former chair of the Department of History, director of the program in Russian and Eastern European Studies, and faculty advisor to the Jewish Student Organization. He is the author of Year of Crisis, Year of Hope, Russian Jury and the Pogroms, of 1881 to 1882, and is currently writing Our People Are Your People, American Jury and the Struggle for Civil Rights, 1954 to 1965. In 1996, Professor Stephen Burke received the prestigious Holocaust Memorial Award from the Holocaust Survivors and Friends Education Center for his years of dedication to understanding and education as a worldwide, clearly, lecturer and spellbinding speaker on the lessons of the Holocaust and its meaning for today. In 2010, he was designated an Israel hero for his defense and advocacy of the state of Israel by JERNY, the Jewish Educational Resources of New York. He has been an annual visit visiting scholar at Beth Sedek. Here it says over a quarter century, but he told me just now for 30 years. Tonight, we thank our own Beth Sedek, Beth Amos Beis Yehuda, the Jewish Foundation of Greater Toronto, and the Beth Sedek Men's Club, to the Sam and Sarah Kersner and Joseph Kersner Holocaust Memorial Institute lecture tonight, this evening. We're not so off schedule. Uh, we welcome our friends watching on live stream. Professor Burke will be speaking about 
from Emperor Iran, from Emperor to Ayatollah. There will be no Q&A following because it is Friday night and we all need to come back to shul tomorrow at 9.30. <laughs> Professor Burke will also be speaking tomorrow morning uh, during the sermon slot, so thank you for that, Professor Burke, on the Islamic Republic, and then he will be back in this room for Q&A for all three of his lectures. Professor Stephen Burke, let's all pay, give him attention and end our side conversations so we can learn, which is what we came here for. Shabbat Shalom, my friends. It is good to be back here. And it's good to know that some things never change. You have a Friday night meal at Beth Sedek. It's really very, very good. I've been here for 30 years every Friday night. It has been a very good meal. So I thank you very much. It really is very nice to be here. That's the mic that goes, that goes to the people on the live stream. So All right. move them together. Who's this here? All right. Is that good, Gary? Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. All right. Let me begin by saying to you something that does not appear in the Talmud. Woe to the speaker who speaks late on a Friday night. <laughs> now, I must tell you, I have, I think I've told you this before, I have really, I've been lecturing, I've been at Union College for 55 years, and it's my good fortune to travel really all over the world and occasionally to give lectures. I'm not sensitive. So if you want to, I'll use the old language. If you want to hop a dremel when I'm speaking, it's all right. It's all right. It happens. I used to do a lot of lecturing at night to teach evening students. And I used to fall asleep in my own lectures. No, no, I did this is not a joke, and it is true. I would have these little vignettes. I was so tired. And nice guy that I am, what I would do, I saw the students look at me as if, they, I, that as if I was talking in tongues. So when I caught myself, I would ask them a question that I knew they would never be able to answer in a million years. And of course, they couldn't answer it. And I said, you should have been paying attention. So if you want to hop a dremel, it's all right. Now, believe it or not, it does say in an obscure passage in the Talmud that when the third temple is built, there should be a plaque on the wall honoring a Persian king. And that Persian king was Cyrus. Because Cyrus did something that changed the course of Jewish history. You all know this if you've studied in Hebrew school or day school or yeshiva, you know about the Edict of Cyrus. I must tell you from a scholarly point of view, there are some scholars who say it never existed, that this is a fabrication, something placed in the Tanakh. But whether that is true or not, I do not know. What we do know is that Cyrus was a very, very benevolent emperor and a very shrewd one in the sense that he allowed the people that he conquered a good deal of autonomy. And he also allowed, and this is why it changes Jewish history, he allowed the Jews to return from Babylonia. Cyrus and the Persians had conquered Babylonia. And of course, I'm sure you all remember, in the year 586 before the Common Era, Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple, and thousands, if not tens of thousands of Jews were carted away. Once again, we do not know how many were actually carted away, and we do not know how many actually returned. But he allowed the Jews to return and to rebuild again, to begin the creation of the Second Temple. At the risk of being historically a heretic, heretic I will say to you that the Edict of Cyrus, whether or not it existed or not, but the fact that he allowed the Jews to return and begin the building of the Second Temple is probably even more important, believe it or not, than the Balfour Declaration. Without the Balfour Declaration, of course, there is no creation of the State of Israel in 1948. But without the return of the Jews to Eretz Yisrael, there is no Second Temple, and they may not have been a Jewish people. So there is Cyrus, and the Jews do well living under the Persians. The great change is going, going to come in the year 634, 634 of the Common Era. Arab armies will sweep out of what we now call the Arabian Peninsula. They'll go to the west, they'll go to the east, and they will conquer what came to be known as Iran, but not until the 1920s. 
It is up until the 1920s, what is called Iran today was known as Persia. That's the Greek word. That's what Greek historians said. They drew it from a place in that area known as Pars, a piece of real estate, and they gave, they took the name Persia and gave it to these people. In 634, the Muslims come. The Arabs come. And two things are going to take place. One really goes to the heart of the contemporary Middle East. I don't know how much you're aware of this. Again, a lot of this is in the news today. People are doing a lot of reading. The tragedy or the great split in Islam comes in the aftermath of Muhammad's death. Who should succeed Muhammad? Should it be a blood relative or should it be among one of his companions, those who marched with him, those who created the new religion? Eventually, it would be decided by the majority of people in the leadership positions that it would be come from some of his companions. But there were those who said it should not be one of those, it should be a blood relative. The only blood relative was his son-in-law, that is actually his cousin, and that was Ali. And those who supported Ali come to be known as the Shia. That's the great split. And that's very, very important because as I'm sure you know, it resonates down to the present day. Ali's son, Hussein, is going to fight in order to take control, to become the caliph, and he will be killed. He was killed outside of the town or the city of Kabbalah in what is today today's Iraq. This is a monumental turning point in Islamic history. Kabbalah is a shrine. Those who follow the Shia, the party of Ali, these are the people. It always comes around the time of our Passover. That is the Shia holiday of Ashura. You must have seen some of this on television. When, reacting the passion of Hussein, Muslims in Iran, Shiite Muslims in Iran, walk around with whips and they flagellate themselves. They are reenacting the martyrdom of Hussein. This is the split. And no, there can be no understanding of the contemporary Middle East unless you understand this. This is the great split. And with the passage of time, different rituals, different prayers, and a different way, the Germans have a good word for it, a Weltanschauung, a different way of looking at the world. And so that's the first thing that occurs. And then later on in the seventh, the seventh century of the Common Era, the Muslim leadership, the leaders of Sunni Islam, Sunni Islam, which is the majority party, those are the people who did not go along with Ali. They are the ones that opposed the Shia. They are now going to implement what comes to be known as the Code of Omar. And that is, again, a very important turning point, not only in Islamic history, but in Jewish history. From the Islamic perspective, what do you do with all of those people who are not Arabs? What do you do with all of those people that are not Muslims? What do you do with the Jews? What do you do with the Christians that we have conquered? What do you do with the Zoroastrians? That's the major religion before Islam comes in Persia. What do we do with them? And the answer is we create a new status for them, a new position. They come to be known, non-Muslims in the Islamic world come to be known as Dahimis, D-H-I-M-M-I. A Dahimi is a protected person. According to Islamic law, those who do not convert, Jews and Christians and Zoroastrians, if they choose not to convert, they are to be allowed to live in society, pay certain taxes, and occupy certain positions, but not all positions. They're not allowed into the military. Sometimes in some places they're not allowed to ride horses. In some places they have forced to wear distinctive clothing. But please make no mistake about this. There is a historian that would deny what I'm about to tell you. For a thousand years, it was probably better to be a Jew living under Islam than to be a Jew living under Christendom. Hands down. No burning of the Talmud. No pogroms for the most part. I don't want to idealize it. There are some difficult times for Jews in Moorish Spain and elsewhere and even in Persia. There is, it's difficult, but it is much better again to be a Jew living under Islam than it is to be living under Christendom. So this is a good time, a relatively good time in the Islamic world. And when the Turks take over or create the Ottoman Empire, the position is going to be a good one. 
It's no coincidence. In 1492, after the Inquisition and after the expulsion of the Jews from Spain, they don't go to Central Europe and Eastern Europe. Some do. They go to Amsterdam, they go to Prague, they go to some places. But the bulk of the Jews who flee Spain go to the Islamic world. They go to Salonika, they go to Sarajevo, they go to Istanbul, they spread out over the North Africa and the Littoral. But the Jews, again, one ought not to romanticize it, as some people in the Islamic world do to this day, and some Jewish historians did in the late 19th century. They argue this was a time of confluence, that everybody was equal in the Islamic world. Don't think that correct for a second. The Jews did better, again, for the third time under Islam than they did under Christendom. But they were still, I'll use a term that would never be used 500 years ago, they were still second-class citizens. This is going to change. It's going to change for the worst in Persia when a Persian dynasty known as the Safavids are going to accept, up until this period of time, despite the existence of the Shia, most of the people living in Persia were Sunni Muslims. They rejected this idea that Ali was a legitimate heir. The Safavids now come in from the 16th century through the 18th century. They now introduce Shia Islam into Persia. And when that happens, they hammer at it. For 200 years, they hammer it, and they are successful. By the end of the 18th century, nearly all of the non-Muslims, let us say, nearly all of the Muslims living in Persia were Shiite Muslims. And why do I say that's important? Now, here we get into some really technical nitty-gritty. There is a concept of tahara, of purity within Islam. Devout Muslims are told, before you pray, make sure that there is no urine on your clothing, on your undercoating. Make sure that no feces appears on your clothing. You must be pure, not only in your physical appearance, but you must be pure in your mind. That is the concept of Islamic purity. The Safavids go beyond that and say that non-Muslims are ritually impure. Don't laugh at what I'm about to tell you because it is very, very significant. That is, when foreigners, Christians travel to Persia in the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries, some of whom were anti-Semites. Some of these Christian travelers were anti-Semites. Nonetheless, they lamented the fact they lamented the terrible treatment that was meted out to the Jews. What does it mean when you say an individual is ritually impure? It means that when it rains, Jews were not allowed into the streets in some Persian cities and towns, lest the rain pour off the Jew and really fall on a Muslim. The Muslim then becomes ritually impure. We are talking about an extremist form of Islam, at least in terms of the way it looked at impurity. And those foreigners who will come to Persia in the 18th and 19th and 20th centuries, again, once again, many of whom were anti-Semites, people who despised Jews. But they would write back, and when they came back, they would speak about how terrible it was, how Jews walking on the street had to go into the, walking on a sidewalk, would have to go into the street of a Muslim was about to pass or how the youngest of children would take a rock and throw it at a rabbi, throw it at a, an elderly Jew. The position of Jews in Persia was difficult, not impossible. We are not talking about massive slaughters. And in the middle of the 19th century, the Jews would have someone, and they would benefit to a certain extent, just as we, well, just as American Jews, I forgot where I am, just as American Jews, have benefited from living under an umbrella. An umbrella composed of Latinos, of blacks, and Asians. When my compatriots hate, when Americans hate, they hate by and large on the basis of race. That's the American Michigas. That is this hatred of people on the basis of race. And to a certain extent, if I was giving you a lecture on the history of the American, Jew American Jewish community, I would make the point that one of the essential reasons, you cannot minimize this, one of the essential reasons that have Jews have done so well in America is we are white. In a country that obsesses about race, 
the fact that the Jews are white will serve them very, very well. In the case of Persia, beginning in the middle of the 19th century, another group appeared, a group that appeared to be more odious, more obnoxious than the Jews. And that is a group that continues to exist down to the present day. I have a colleague who is a member of the Baha'i faith. The Baha'is are hated, hated because it's a spin-off from Islam. The Bab, the founder of the Baha'i faith, is a man that talked about the equality of all religions, a very peaceful religion, no talk about jihad, and so on. Today in Iran, just to make the point to you, and then I'll pick up the historical flow, the government of the Islamic Republic recognizes a number of religions as legitimate. Of course, Islam, Judaism is considered to be a legitimate religion. So too is Christianity. So too is Zoroastrianism, the ancient religion of the Persians, but not the Baha'is, not the Baha'is. The Baha'is suffer even more restrictions and have been murdered on more occasions and have been discriminated against more than the Jews. And by the end of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century, the winds of change were coming. One in a positive way and the other in a negative way. The positive way is the ideas of the Enlightenment, the ideas of representative government, the ideas of democracy, parliamentary systems of government. That was coming into Persia. And so too, on the negative way, it was something else. The early, late 19th, early 20th centuries, this is the twilight of European imperialism. The British and the Russians are going to now come into Persia. They will inflict a great deal of discrimination, humiliation upon the Persians. If you want to understand, let me say to you what I tell the students at the first day of every course that I teach at Union College. You cannot explain the present by the present. Everything has a history. If you want to understand the hostility of contemporary Iran to the West in general, and ultimately the United States in particular, you have to understand the twilight of imperialism. When the British and the Russians came, they took control of the sale of tobacco. They took control of the sale of opium. They dominated the country. They humiliated the Iranian or the Persian people. Now, what's going to happen, of course, is there's going to be a revolt against that. Here's the one Arabic word that you have to know. It is what is known as the ulama, U-L-A-M-A. -A. The ulama is the Islamic clergy. They are furious with the changes that have been taking place. So too are the bazaris, the people in the bazaars, because their position is undermined by the massive influx of British manufactured goods. Lots of people imbued by the new nationalism are going to want an elimination of this foreign influence and want a parliamentary government. And what is going to happen is there's a revolution, a revolution in 1910 and 1911 in Iran. A constitutional government is created. The Shah remains, but he becomes a figurehead. But the problem is, it's chaos in Iran, chaos in Persia, from 1911 to 1922. And then, what do you think is going to happen? It happens in many, many countries, and that is a strong man appears. This is a man from the Cossacks. There are Iranian Cossacks that were trained by Russian Cossacks. His name is known as Reza Khan. And if you were my students, and you were lucky that you are not my students, because I'll tell you what happens. I think I told this to you before. When I ask a question like this of my students, they give me the unsophisticated duh, or the more sophisticated well. But nothing comes forth after that. So I go off the platform, or if I'm lecturing, and I stand in front of a student and ask the student the same question. And you know what? The student gives me the answer. You know why? For those of you the teachers, you never learn this in an, educational, in an educational course, a little bit of intimidation goes a long way. I can get a 20-point rise in the IQ. It doesn't last for more than 15 seconds, but you can get a lot in 15 seconds. And the answer is here, Reza Khan is to Persia what Kemal Ataturk was to Turkey. Again, if you want to understand what is happening in modern Turkey as I'm speaking to you, 
You have to know about Kemal Ataturk. This is, that's his name. His real name was Mustafa Kemal. But because he saved Turkey in the aftermath of World War I, when the British and French wanted to carve up Turkey, as they carved up the Ottoman Empire, Kemal Ataturk, or Mustafa Kemal, rallied the Turkish people. And the new independent Turkey gave him a new name, Kemal Ataturk, which means the father of modern Turkey. Kemal Ataturk wanted to modernize and westernize Turkey. He wanted a true constitutional system, a true legal system, based on French law and not the Sharia. He didn't want people to go to the mosque. He saw Islam as a retarding factor in the modern development of Turkey. He didn't want, he took away the fez. And he put the brim hat on Turkish men. Because if they had the hat on and not the fez, they could not kneel in the ground and really, let us say, pray, put their foreheads to the ground because the hats would fall off. He did all sorts of things, gave women rights that they had never had before. And I must tell you as a parenthesis in Jewish history, he was so desirous, Kemal Ataturk, so desirous of making Turkey a modern country that he allowed several hundred Jewish professors from Germany and Austria to come into Turkey. These were scientists, these were medical people, and so on. We don't think of Turkey as a haven for Jews during the Holocaust or the pre-Holocaust period, but to a certain extent it was. He also, again, wanted to make Turkey a modern power, and he wanted to preserve the neutrality of Turkey. That also is, presents a problem for the Jewish people because comes the war and Jews are fleeing from German-occupied Europe and they want to get to Palestine. Now, you, I don't have a map in front of me. If you're in Romania and you're in the Romanian port of Costanza and you want to get to Palestine, you got to go over the Black Sea and you got to go through the Bosporus. That is that slender piece of water in Istanbul. The Turks preserving their neutrality, pressured by the British not to allow any more Jews into Palestine, that pe those people are going to die. The most famous case here is, of course, the case of the Struma. That's a ship loaded with Jewish refugees that comes from the port of Costanza. The Turks won't let it go, by, go through the straits. The ship finally sails back to its Romanian port of Costanza. It is sunk by a submarine. We used to think it was a German submarine. It was a Soviet submarine. We have no idea why it was sunk. Out of the 664 Jews on board, one survives. The British allow him to go to Palestine. But the point, most important here, is Reza Khan Pahlavi believes this is what I must do in Persia. So what does he do? He restricts the ulama, that is the clergy. He takes away their land. He begins to bring foreigners in begins to have secular schools, begins to introduce a series of reforms. This is the beginning of what comes to be known as the Pahlavi dynasty, because he takes a name, a name from an old, or an old language, Pahlav. And what does he call himself? Reza Khan Pahlavi. That's what he calls himself. But he's got a problem. It's a problem that is experienced by a number of people in the Middle East. If you want, you're in the 1930s. And if you want, Russians and the French, if you want them out of the Middle East, whom do you look to? And the answer is, uh, forgive me, I'm not being condescending. We have to finish before Shavuos. I'll give you the right answer. If you are, if you are in Egypt, Lebanon, Syria, even in Palestine, if you want the British, the French out, there's only one man that you look to, and that is Adolf Hitler. It's not Hitler's anti-Semitism that draws them, although the case of some Palestinian Arabs, it is the anti-Semitism. But in the case of the Egyptian military, in the case of Reza Khan Pahlavi, it is, I want to align myself with Germany once the war begins because he thinks the Nazis are gonna win the war. Now, you know that they didn't, thank God, win the war. But some of you are old enough to remember, you were politically conscious in 1940 and 1941. It looks as if the Germans are going to win the war. In the summer of 1941, after the German attack on the Soviet Union on June 22, 1941, that's the beginning of Operation Barbarossa, the Germans 
German cavalry, German panzer divisions, slice through the Ukraine, slice through Belarus as a knife goes through butter. There are very few people who will predict that the Soviet Union will survive this summer, at least the early autumn of 1941. Reza Khan Pahlavi bets on the wrong horse. Because, of course, the Russians survive, the Soviet Union survives, Britain survives, the United States comes into the war, and in the Allied coalition, it is decided in 41 and 42 that Reza Khan Pahlavi has to go. So they pack him up, and he will spend the rest of his life, or a good part of the remaining life, in South Africa. And they put on the throne his young son, Mohammed Reza Khan Pahlavi. This is the last Shah of Iran. That's the one that you and I grew up with. He is not the man his father was. He doesn't look like his father. He's not as imposing a figure. He is not as self-confident as his father, and that's going to cause him a great deal of difficulty. But fair is fair. The British and the Americans and the Russians are going to carve up Iran, and the name Iran is introduced by Reza Khan Pahlavi. We are Aryans. There was a tribe called the Aryans in that part of the world. We're going to take that name. So from the middle of the late, or from the latter part of the 1920s, Persia becomes Iran. That's why we call it Iran at the present day. In fairness to everybody here, that is who is involved in Iranian history, the fact is going to be that something very good happens to the Jewish people in this period of time. It's one of the less, less known aspects of the Holocaust. There were thousands of Jewish orphans that had lost their parents who had gone to the east when the Germans invaded. They passed into Poland, Lithuania. When the Germans took over that area, some of them were lucky enough to flee further east. There were a group of about a thousand Jewish orphans. Stalin, for reasons that we do not understand, Stalin, Stalin was an anti-Semite. But in order to get further the coalition, enhance the, the goodwill here, he allows about 900 Jewish orphans to pass, to leave, to go to Palestine. They go through Tehran. These are people, these is the so-called Tehran children. So that's one of the, the good things that happens in Persia during the war. Comes the end of the war, we prop up. I say we, the United States and the European countries, particularly Britain, prop up Mohammad Reza Khan Pahlavi. We make him our man in the Middle East. This is the man that we are going to support. And remember, what I'm about to tell you and everything after this must be seen. You, must all, you can never divorce a historical actor, actress, or event from the context, from what is happening at the time. This is the Cold War. We are going to support any man who opposes communism. And Mohammed Reza Khan Pahlavi opposes communism. The United States will pour in millions and eventually billions of dollars into Mohammed Reza Khan Pahlavi. But he's got a problem. There are people in Iran who are not devout Muslims. They are highly secular people, like the relationship with the United States. They want a constitutional government. They want change. And above all, they want Iran to get a major share of the income that comes from the sale of oil from the Anglo-Persian oil company. The man, here we come to a turning point in the relationship between Iran and the United States and Iran and the West, exacerbating some of the early tensions. The man I'm talking about is a man that is today revered in Iran. That is Mohammad Mossadegh, Mohammad Mossadegh, who in the early 1950s, in the early 1950s, Mossadegh, a major figure in the Iranian parliament, says, He's a puppet. These are not his words. This is a stooge for the United States and Great Britain. And we, he's allowing them to steal our money. We've got to get, it's our oil. We've got to get 80 to 90% of that money that comes from the sale of oil. The British don't like it. We don't like it. We think he's too far to the left for us. That's what the United States thinks. And we make, we don't understand some things. There was a party, a political party in Iran known as the Tudeh Party, T-U-D-E-H. That literally means a party of the masses. 
This was a left-wing political party which had its orientation around the Soviet Cold War. This is the height of the Cold War. We think Mossadegh is in league with the two dead. He is not. He really, he is sympathetic to what they are saying. They are sympathetic to his idea of taking over the, the Anglo-Persian oil company. But he doesn't like their pro-Moscow orientation. He's not in their pocket. He's not a stooge. But remember, here I tell you what I tell my students all the time. Perception is reality. It doesn't make any difference what is real. It's perception. And the perception in London and in Washington, D.C., is that this man is a man of the left. He is tilting towards the Soviet Union, and he has to be removed. The Shah, Mohammad Reza Khan Pahlavi, also wants him removed because he is talking about a true constitutional government. And he, the Shah doesn't want that. He wants to rule as an absolute ruler. And what nobody admits in Iran today, the ulama, the Islamic clergy, which today makes Mossadegh a great hero and a martyr to American and British imperialism, the ulama didn't like him because Mossadegh was vehemently secular and anti-clerical. What is going to happen is there are demonstrations against Mohammed Mossadegh. He hangs in there. Could he have stayed indefinitely? Don't know. There are massive demonstrations on the streets. But in Washington and London, they're not going to take any chances. So the CIA and MI6 send representatives to, again, Tehran, and they engineer the overthrow of Mohammed Mossadegh. If I were giving a lecture, if they allowed me to give a lecture in Tehran, and I said to them what I'm saying to you, I'm not sure they would lynch me, but they would make life very, very difficult. Because I said something, what they would love is, oh, prof, you did the right thing. You spoke about the American imperialism. We love that. But that I also said that the ulama also wanted to get rid of Mossadegh, they would never accept that. In other words, we interfered. Would he have lasted if we didn't interfere? That's a question that we'll never know. But he did interfere. We did interfere. And to this day, that is hurled against the United States, the West, and Great Britain. We used them. We manipulated them. We interfered in their internal politics. We took a good man out, a man that was a, an Iranian nationalist. We took him out. And again, if you want to understand why the United States, under the Ayatollah Khomeini, is referred to as the big Satan. That's important. What I just told you about Mossadegh incident, that's important. And then something else. You know what the great turning point in the history of the Middle East is? It goes beyond Iran. It involves the entire Islamic world. For us, 1948 is the year of liberation. After almost 2,000 years, the Jewish people have created a state and millions have returned to their ancient homeland. But for the Arabs, it is al-Nakba, the catastrophe, an ignominious, a humiliating defeat, the likes of which Islam has never suffered. Everything must be done to reverse the Nakba. Now, if it takes one year, 10 years, 100 years, the Nakba has to be reversed. Do you know that Saddam Hussein in his underground bunker, who do you think he had a picture of? You know who it was? It was Nebuchadnezzar. He destroyed the temple. That's our model. And, of course, in old man Assad's, Hafez al-Assad's bunker, or in his office, you know who he had a picture of? Saladin. Saladin is the great Kurdish warrior that won the Crusades, that won back Jerusalem for, these, for Muslims, for Islam. So 1948 is important, Mossadegh is important, and then we prop the Shah up. Again, even more than we've ever done before. Our president, Jimmy Carter, went to visit him. He established, that is, the Shah established his linkage. I mean, the world is filled with Bubamites. Keep that in mind. Every country has its own Bubamites. And what is the Bubamites in Iran? that the Shah of Iran, the Pahlavis, are the direct descendants of Cyrus and Darius. That's a crock. 
They have as much relation to them as I do to them. And I can assure you, I have no relationship whatsoever to them. But that's the myth. And the Shah does what he can to stay in power. Now, before an American audience, I don't know if you study this in America, in Canadian political science courses. But if you, ever if you went to an American college or university and you studied American politics, the essential reading was a book by a Frenchman, Alexis de Tocqueville, Democracy in America. That's the standard account of the American political character. To this day, people study this. But people don't realize that the de Tocqueville, when he's a Frenchman, he also wrote about the French Revolution. And one of the things he said is a really interesting thing. It applies probably in more than one place. Here's the translation from the French. The worst time for a bad government is when it decides to reform itself. The worst and most dangerous time for a bad government is when it engages in reform. And that's what's going to happen in the 1960s, 1963 to 1979, when the Shah of Iran, seeking support, is going to implement what comes to be known as the White Revolution, the revolution from above. Land reform, taking land away from the landlords, never been done before. His father didn't even do that, Reza Khan Pahlavi. He really bridles the ulama, of the Islamic clergy. And in one of the, the less felicitous terms he uses when he refers to the ulama, he says they are lice-infected mullahs. They're dirty. They're stupid. They're reactionary. You don't have to be Sigmund Freud to come to the conclusion that the ulama will not be enamored, enamored with Mohammed Reza Khan Pahlavi. And there's growing opposition, growing opposition to him. But he has his supporters. A number of Jews are supporters. Into the universities. They allow them to go and become professionals. They allow them to enter into business. Jewish life beginning in the 40s, even getting better, 50s, 60s, and 70s. The Jews are one of the beneficiaries. There's a whole new bureaucracy that is created. But underneath it all, there's a great deal of discontent. What do you think happens when there's land reform? When people are no longer, they go into the cities. By the millions, they go to Tehran. And the urban infrastructure of Tehran cannot support them. These people live in hovels. They live on the streets. Some of the women engage in prostitution. This is a period of dramatic social change. And what gets a number of Iranian intellectuals in real trouble? The Shah knows that there's growing discontent. So the Shah, following the lead of other governments, creates a ferocious, vituperative secret police. That is known as the Savak. The people who fall work for the Savak, these are the Savakis. This is light, not as bad as the Gestapo, not as bad as the NKVD, but by Middle Eastern standards, very, very tough. And so, my friends, as we come into the 1970s, there's a phalanx of opposition to Mohammad Reza Khan Pahlavi. The opposition is growing, and the opposition focuses around a man who has become a martyr, a man whose son was killed, supposedly killed by the Savak, a man who opposed the Shah early on, a man who suffered exile and a man whose books nobody read. Only the ulama read them. Ordinary Iranians, they didn't read him. All they knew is, this is our man. This is the man that we must rally to. Well, if you're a woman, you want him. You're a university student, you want him. You're an intellectual, you want him. Or you're in the bazaars, you're a bazari, you want him. If you're a secular intellectual, you want him. He is the antithesis of Mohammed Reza Khan Pahlavi. And who is that man? That's the Ayatollah Khomeini. And that's the man we will talk about tomorrow morning. Shabbat Shalom.
Yasher Koach, and thank you for leaving us on that cliffhanger. <laughs> uh, tomorrow morning, come to shul or watch it at home, and uh, we will pick up with uh, Khomeini, I believe. Always eye-opening and amazing that there wasn't a single note like usual. Um, get home safely. Thank you so much, Professor Burke. We look forward to learning from you again tomorrow. And as a reminder, if you are here with us, there will be time for Q&A during Kiddush tomorrow, right back in this room. Shabbat Shalom.